Good evening, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, to Trot on the Plastic. Oh, busting out the British accent today, John, are we? Yeah. A little cockney. Mm. <laughs> okay, uh, name one cockney rhyming scheme. A rhyming scheme? So it's a slang, right? Cockney is a slang. So apples and pears is slang for stairs. Oh, right. Do you know any other rhymes in cockney? Um... I do, but it's. I can't <laughs> think of any. Put you on the spot. Yeah, in under one minute. <laughs> you figure it out. <laughs> Dog and bones is phone. Oh, so you put them two together? But like, I also thought it was like three degrees of separation. It's just like, mm. you know, uh, apple has a core, and then core rhymes with boar, and then boars have tusks. So when I say tusks, I mean apples. Like that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> I think there probably is a little bit of that going on as well. Uh, but this is not a podcast about linguistics or British slang. It's a podcast about miniatures. So it's for the miniature hobby enthusiasts. Welcome if you're joining us for the first time. If you're an old timer, you're not welcome. Get out of here. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm sitting, All right. I'm sitting so low at my desk right now. And it's so, so like my arms are way up like here like this. And I like don't know what to do with my hands. Yeah. I'm just you know, gonna just, do this. just lay them flat on your desk. Yeah, but then they go like this. I'll just put them at my sides. There you go. That looks natural. Yeah. <laughs> like fucking... For all you audio listeners, you don't give a hoot about what's going on right now. Uh, but let's start with some some extra info. And that is is that we are in the process of designing some new t-shirts for the podcast. Whoop, whoop, woo. Yeah, like we, we have been f- like fiddling with ideas and brainstorming stuff since day one. You know, like it seems like after every podcast or every other podcast, we're like, ooh, shirt idea. (laughs) Um, But we, I mean, we, I mean, I even drew up some sketches of stuff. We were trying to, I don't want to, I don't want to like share what, because I think that, that shirt idea may still come to pass one day. Yeah. Um, But that's not going to be this one. I think we're pretty, like, we're pretty close on this one. Right. Mm -hmm. You think so? Um, yeah, it all just comes down to filing, finding someone who can nail the vision that you're after. So we have a very specific idea and we just got to find an artist who draws in a style that complements that idea and then we'll be good to go. We'll just throw money at them and then they'll, they'll draw it for us. Yeah. The hard yeah. part is finding the person that's in my experience, at least. I, I think that's probably a fair assessment. So if any of you sprudes and spruettes out there are good artistes. And, or you know one and uh you know if, if you like no one you're like hey show shoot out our you know their information oh. <laughs> wow <laughs> it took a while to arrive there didn't we john yeah, yeah it was yeah, a, yeah. it was, a, it was a it's slow. not even the morning it's 1 p.m right now and he's this slow yeah like we jumped right into recording here and usually we have this like <laughs> man we're just chatting and you know what was, what's going on and here we just like wow let's go Okay, next thing. Has quarantine led you to painting more or less? Interesting question. Um, I'll go first here so John can warm up his brain. Uh, I think quarantine (laughs) has led me to paint less. And I'll explain why. Um, I may have already said this a little bit, but um, the whole uh, light at the end of the tunnel that was Adepticon not happening... uh, made me just real apathetic to want to do any kind of thing that I associate with work and painting is associated with work in that, in that regard. So I am still painting because I do it for videos and stuff like that, but I am definitely going a lot slower than I normally would. And so, so, so quarantine, which is also related to why Adepticon was canceled and which is the reason why I'm feeling so apathetic about working, I would say it's all related. So to answer the question, I'm definitely painting less. So, what are what's filling that that time i'm curious oh, so man video games yeah yeah video games me and ever bought a nintendo switch so we're playing mario kart with some friends and also just by ourselves and also some mobas with my friends in wisconsin and man it's just a lot of a lot of video games yeah a lot of video games and doom you're still doing oh, doom i beat doom eternal i at this point almost 100 percented it on ultra nightmare or not ultra nightmare ultra violence and i'm gonna do a nightmare run through at some point too so yeah i'm excited about that is nightmare more difficult than ultra violence i assume 
Yeah, it is. The Nightmare is the hardest one. Um, and then there is one harder than Nightmare, which I think is Ultra. It's a night, whatever the heck it's called. But it's if you die once, you have to start the entire game over. Oh, um, hard, hardcore mode. Yeah, yeah. hardcore mode. Uh, so I want to try that at some point too. Uh, but that's going to be maybe later down the line. Oh, gosh. All right. So I feel you there. When, when this first started and, you know, right around the Adepticon time, you know, end of March, I was painting a lot more. And so it's just more for fun and more just kind of like, you know, I just want to do some things and, and not worry too much about it and just get more projects accomplished. So I started out that way. And then I, two things happened. Um, and so it, it caused me to paint less. Mm. The first one will, I'll just say is video games. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I specifically start, Borderlands. No, I, I stopped that and I started playing Magic Arena. Oh no! Uh, so Magic the Gathering. I haven't played Magic the Gathering in like ten years. But I used to be a pretty hardcore Magic player for many years, fifteen years, and um, I just got back into it. And I'm just like, oh man, it's so good. It's like the addiction is real. Like as soon as I start playing, it's like, ooh, I just need to do more of this, more of this. And it's so easy to get into like drafts. I love, I love drafts and sealed, and so it's so easy to get into that. So. So that's one in which I need to cut down on that big time. My, my <laughs> wife told me this as well. Um, he's like, you need to, this, this amazing space that you built down here is not for you to sit and play video games. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> the guilt. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that was one. And the other one is um, I'm gotten into, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but um, I'm filming what I'm painting now. And oh. so if I, I do some tests, you know, tests to figure out like how and where to put the camera, like right over your shoulder, like a shoulder bazooka from GI Joe mm -hmm. and the, the focus and my fucking arm, like f going all over the place. So I never s keep the thing on, on screen. And, and so practice with that. And also I started a, a, a mini for a video idea. And so I'm just doing each section of that. And so Every time that I'm just going to sit down and paint, there's like now all these extra steps involved. I got to mm -hmm. get the camera all set up. I got to make sure I understand what I'm going to do. I got to make sure I should take shots of the paints I'm using. I need to make sure that, um, you know, everything is in focus and that I have, it's just like, I've just added more steps for myself. And it's mostly probably because this is new to me. Probably for you, it's kind of subconscious and you just kind of like, oh, you just go through the motions to get everything set up and it doesn't feel like mm -hmm. extra. But to me, it just feels like an extra burden to just put paint on something. Yep. Yep. Okay. So we're going to talk about this later, right? Yeah. Okay. So I won't say anything at this point, but I feel you. <laughs> I feel you on a lot of things you're saying. Um, but yeah, Spruz and Sprouts, why don't you let us know if quarantine is improving, not improving, but uh, increasing the volume of pain that you're doing or if it is decreasing it. Uh, I have a feeling that for most of our listeners, it's going to have increased it. And the reason why I think that is because last podcast, we had a poll about how much you enjoy the painting process on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is the, a lot and one is not at all. Um, and you and I, or I said I was at a three. Uh, you said you were at a what? Like four or five, something like that? Yeah, I'd say five. Okay. 50-50. Fif the the spruits and spruits, the plurality of votes were was at an eight, uh, with second place being seven. So wow. What, I, what I'm assuming here is that they have a much better relationship with their hobby than we do, uh, which means that when they get additional time, uh, they're going to spend it painting, unlike us who fucking playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm going to assume most of you have been very productive, which, if that is true, is totally awesome. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. I, I hope that's true, but mm. I, I don't know. Like, the one thing that surprises me is how many folks are very active in the mini painting communities, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Discords, whether it's Twitch, whether it's whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're very active and they have all these things to say and they're always commenting, posting, and they're always have, you know, are always there, but they don't paint that much. And so <laughs> I think, honestly, I think that there's, there's a balance there that needs to be, be taken into account as well. I'm hoping one of the, one of our kind of our, mission statements for or purposes of this whole podcast is folks can listen to it while they paint 
Right. Yeah. That's you know, definitely the goal. Now, if if we put out a podcast every single day and folks were listening to every podcast while they paint, oh my God, the increase in hours painted would be awesome. We only put out an episode every other week, so it's not necessarily increasing your total uh, painting time. Are you saying that people's productivity is reliant on us making a podcast? Absol- I don't think you want to put that burden on us right now. Absolutely. 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 I, I certainly expect everyone listens to every podcast 14 times until the next <laughs> Once a day. <laughs> this is the only podcast you listen to. The only podcast. You know, extra info, too. We should probably mention this. I didn't put this in the notes, but um, our our buddies uh, started their own mini podcast. We should probably give them Goobs? a shout out. Goobs and uh, eBay. eBay Rescue Miniatures. Yeah, eBay Rescue Miniatures. Mm-hmm. Definitely, yeah. And they're posting their stuff on our off Monday and so every single Monday, you will get a miniature painting focused podcast. So if you want to check out Goobses, Goobses, <laughs> you, want check, you want to check out Goobs and eBay Rescue Mentors uh, podcast, it'll be linked in the show notes below. Um, they popped out <laughs> like it's a baby. Uh, their first two episodes, probably, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks ago, something like that at this point. Yeah, episode three just launched too. I started listening to that last mm-hmm. night. Name nice. of the podcast is Paint Bravely. I don't know if we said that or not. Paint nope, we did not. Bravely. They, they're they a little bit less uh, jackasses than us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, so if you need less jackass in your life, right. go check them out. <laughs> we got two nice young strapping lads that you can go check out. Young strapping lad. Laddie. All right. All right. Let's talk about what we've painted. Um. In this past week, uh, I started to, not in this past week, maybe a little bit ago, I started to crack into uh, finishing uh, projects that I owe to people. What are you doing right now, John? You're frustrating me. I'm listening to you talk about what you're painting. (laughs) ugly. John's making faces at me while I'm talking. Um, Anyways, uh, I've started to start to deal with some of the commissions and promises that I made people. So I finished up a video for a friend whose wedding I shot like six years ago at this point uh, or five years ago, a long time ago. Um, finished that, but I also finished a commission and this is related. Uh, I finished a bust. It's a Death Corpse Creek bust. And the day we're recording this is a Thursday. The video will come out publicly tomorrow. And it's all about texture, um, how to get texture on a miniature and have it look to scale and realistic in all the ways that I know how to paint texture. So yeah, I painted that bust. It's the third bust I think I've painted in my life. Um, and it's a, it's a big one. It's, it's like somewhere in between one to six to one to eight scale. So it was fairly large, a lot of, a lot of many to paint. Um, it was good to experiment with different ways to get texture. Is it like the size of your fist or something or like how, how big? Yeah. That's I would say big. the size of my fist. That's a pretty beefy boy. Oh yeah, he's got like a backpack and a gun and all that stuff too, and a box on his stomach. So he's like not only no, it's the normal human form, but it's also like stuff built on top of it as well. So is it pronounced corpse? I think core. It's, it could be core. Yeah, yeah, because it's like Marine Corps. But if it's there's an S there too, I think it's core. So death, death core, Krieg. Yeah, that sounds way more badass than death corpse. <laughs> Because otherwise it just sounds like there's a dead body. It's the death corpse creep. <laughs> Which is kind of badass too. Yeah, I mean, it is, that is equally badass. Uh, honestly, we're we're about, you know, one or two more months into this whole uh, uh, virus spreading thing from us all uh, donning that same outfit design that they wear anyway. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Those masks are sweet. I wish I had one. I would totally wear it to the grocery store. And just creep everyone out. Yeah. It makes me so mad when people don't wear masks at the grocery store. Have you seen this? Have you heard about this? Oh, yeah. I mean, whenever whenever we go to a place that's like an enclosed space, like a grocery store, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Like if we're walking the dogs, we don't wear a mask. But if we go to the grocery store, we, we put on we put on masks. Um, and none of the employees at Cub do that. Um, but all the patrons do. It's kind of weird. Yeah. It's like 50-50 at the, the high V in, in town here. It's like half of the employees wear them and the other half don't. I'm like, what Bizarre. is this? Uh, and then it's like 50-50 for patrons too, which really 
that bugs the crap out of me. But hmm. whatever. We're not going to get into this political gar- jargon and stuff. <laughs> We're going to talk about nerdy painting stuff. What did Heck I yeah. What did I what? paint? All right, so this is kind of alluding to um, what I just talked about um, and what I've been painting. So I've been testing painting while filming, and I have my first video idea kind of all base coated and ready, and the, the focus of the video is not going to be on that part of it. Um, but before I started filming that, I wanted to start painting to, to just kind of work out some of the kinks. I realized it's going to it's, it's going to be garbage. It's going to be garbage. The video is going to be garbage. So I'm just like, I just need to do it. Now learn from the garbage, you know, mm. and, and then hopefully everyone doesn't like anti-subscribe. I assume that, <laughs> right? They're like... Unsubscribe. Right, no, no, it's like, I'm not subscribed yet, but I'm going to click this button. That means I'm never going to ever look at your shit ever again because you're first... Hide this channel from my... <laughs> forever. From my gaze. <laughs> because it was so bad. Um, and so I started painting this uh, guild ball lady. Uh, for a buddy for D and D and it's a uh, alchemist and there's an alchemist guild and there's alchemist as a class in D and D and he's a plays a female alchemist and this model is amazing. So he ordered it off of uh, their steam forges website and it came in the mail and he's like, Hey, it's arrived. I'm leaving it in my mailbox for you. And so, cause you know, I'm not going to get close to him. And so I, got in my truck and I ran over there and I like picked it up. Like I was committing a felony by opening somebody else's mailbox. <laughs> yeah. And to my, uh, delight, it's a resin model. Yes. Yes. And the gill ball resin. Oh my gosh. It is so smooth. It's very sharp. Yeah. They have plastic kits where like you can buy a whole team of six players, but every once in a while, Maybe not every once in a while, but a lot of their single one-off characters come in resin. And so it's hard to know when you're buying stuff from them what it's going to end up being. But I think a safe bet is if it's a single model, it's going to be resin. If it comes in a box, it's plastic. A lot of their single ones are metal too, but I don't know if they've just gone to pure resin for the new stuff or if it's just like that limited or whatever they call them. There's there's like a special name for them because she had that same... Oh, let me check it. Oh, like veteran models? Yeah, veteran. She's a veteran. Veteran calculus. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I know they're done with pewter, so, you know, it's kind of confusing what they're actually doing because at one point they were like, we want everything to be in plastic, but then they were like, wait, this detail is not that great, so maybe they, <laughs> they decided to, you know, reverse to do resin for their for their one-offs or I don't know. Um, I know veterans aren't the only ones that get resin releases. My new... Uh, mortician captain came in resin and she's mm-hmm. not a, a vet player. Um, but who knows? I don't know what it is. Steve oh. Forge, fix your shit. <laughs> Just keep doing all resin and you make us all happy. Um, so this is me painting her is the Rodrigo Acore style of starting with your darkest color. So your darkest shadow in every okay. surface and then building straight up from dark from there. Okay. And... I'm going to talk a little bit about this in the after party today too. Um, kind of a little bit of a sneak preview of what I'm going to eventually when this video comes out, like I said, it's not going to be my first one, but um, eventually when this comes out, some of the stuff I'm already starting to learn with this. And so I'm going to talk about that in the after party today. So yeah, that that's kind of it. Like I said, there's, that's not a whole lot in two weeks. I did finish all the base coating of my giant boner boy uh, <laughs> statue. <laughs> for that so which was That's a good. lot is that so many bones so many, let me get it. <laughs> so many bones <laughs> that's good bro look at all those bones look yeah, at i think it's pretty gigantic it's just why why are you painting the terrain first man why don't you paint the minis because i'm gonna paint them all as a video so i can't just paint one uh, doucher well, you could you and could. this is gonna you know, be who a, would know who would know if you painted three boner boys and just didn't didn't show them on camera well i would know okay Okay. And if they ever found out, they would unsubscribe and then never subscribe. See, you just don't let anyone know. But on the topic of recording while painting, I'm assuming this is the point when you wanted to talk about that or where you were going to talk about that. Yeah. I'm going to talk about it in the, in the, um, in the something new I've done in a little bit more uh, depth in the, in the after party, but okay understandable i can talk about it a little bit uh at this point everything i paint goes on camera 
and the way I've set up my space is such that it's incredibly easy to start recording. Like, uh, audio listeners, bear with me, but if you're watching the video right now, in order for me to start recording, all I have to do is this. I just fold a, a camera down and then it's in the right spot, it's in the right angle, and I'm ready to go. And then when I shoot a talking head, it just goes right back up. And then it's stuck there. Super convenient. And so there's a, a lot of things just like that. The lights I use to film with are the same lights I use to paint with. So everything's just ready to rock right when I need it. So there's not much waiting around. And I'm guessing that was uh, years of dealing with frustrations or, or thinking about ways that you could improve it and what you'd ideally like. And then mm -hmm. kind of, you know, mad scientisting that together. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even now at this point, I, the angle that I have the camera at still gets obscured by things like when I pull too far to the right, you can't really see what's going on. So I don't know. I've been doing this for four years and I still fuck it up all the time. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if there's a perfect solution. Uh, Srash tries to figure it out. So maybe I should talk to him because his stuff's always tight. Toy. Um, Toy. Toy. Maybe he's got this like this arm sling thing, right? And like, it's like, it looks like a cast, like you have a cast in your arm and it's like mm -hmm. bolted to his table. And mm -hmm. so he puts his left arm into it mm. and then he can still move the wrist, but it never gets out of frame. Mm. What if like, you know, you got like a mouth guard, like football players, you got one yeah. of those that you just attach a GoPro to. And so like wherever you're facing, the camera is always pointed at the mini. Wow. Yeah, so he's gonna be biting constantly and <laughs> holding up the weight of a camera with your teeth. It's like a, it's like a it's like a jaw like workout too. Like you're just gonna yeah. have such like your yeah. your jaw is gonna like expand from all the muscles from keeping that in there all the time. And I had the sickest smile ever, dude. <laughs> Massive <laughs> cheeks. You wanna know I got these scars. <laughs> Awesome. So you're, you painted a guild ball model and a terrain piece for your Osiak Bone Reapers, and I painted a bust. Yeah. Um, that's cool. What did you guys paint in the last two weeks? Sprues and spruettes? We'd love to hear in the comment section below if you're watching the video. Uh, today for the topic... Meat and potatoes. A little bit meat, and, meat and potatoes of the episode. We can't forget. Today for the meat and potatoes. Yes. As John's forcing me to say. Yes. Uh, we're doing something a little bit different. So as part of being a patron of the podcast, you have the ability to suggest topics for us to to discuss and a lot of the topics we get uh while they are good conversation pieces they're not long enough for a full episode by themselves and so we're going to do a little variety platter today where we go Ooh. through three of them and talk about uh you know give some opinions and some thoughts and whatnot it's called the happy family episode happy fam why is it called that I mean, you go to a Chinese restaurant and the happy family is where oh, it gives a, all, yeah. a couple of different dishes that you all share yeah happy yeah, family like I never know. Okay, I mean, there are some basic things you get at a Chinese restaurant, but one time I got the Happy Family just for myself without knowing what it was, and it was so much freaking food. <laughs> like, not just your average Chinese food, a Chinese American food amount, but like three times that amount, and I was like, oh my God. So yeah, that that's more for multiple people, not just yourself, lesson learned. No, well, you know. Speaking of meat and potatoes, what's your favorite kind of potato, Scott? Like your favorite oh, way man. to have potatoes. Oh man. Let's talk about I mean, French, food. Can we talk about food for the rest of the episode? No, we can't. Uh, uh, <laughs> French fries are good and classic, but nothing beats a creamy mashed potato with cheese mixed in and also some roasted garlic. Big fan of that. Mm. I, yes. Yeah. I like a really good French fry for, is really hard to beat, but mm. Like a really well done twice baked potato. Ooh, yeah. Oh, baby. That is so good and so bad That's for you. Dude, some scallions and some cheddar and mm. some bacon on there. It's just a, it's like a cloud of <laughs> calories. Are you, a, are you a sour cream man or not? Yeah. In okay. moderation. Like, I don't just like <laughs> dollop it everywhere. <laughs> okay. Like, it's a, a bit. I need to taste it, but it needs to not be like sour cream and there was something else under there. I don't even know what it you was. You standards. You have standards. Yeah. It's all about ratios <laughs> my wife hates sour cream i think it's more the idea of what it is than than the taste 
because it's a lovely creamy tangy addition to things yeah. like nachos and chili and whatnot but you can't get past the it's chunky milk uh, <laughs> idea <laughs> what does she eat hot dogs uh i mean yeah let's, let's not go there with hot dogs <laughs> all right meat potatoes all right, first topic happy family comes. dish number one ha- yes dish number one the chicken uh comes from Irk, or i will now attempt to pronounce his name which is quarantine uh i don't know i suppose i don't know how to pronounce his last name so i'm not even gonna try but his question or his topic was about touring miniatures to various competitions and if you don't know what this means this refers to painting a single model and then entering it in multiple painting competitions and winning with it multiple times um any opening thoughts, John? I am totally against it. Unless it was me, then I'm totally for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's an interesting thought here where it's like, okay, if you won, it feels wrong. But if you mm. didn't win, then it's like, eh, whatever. Like, sure, you can try again. So it's like, can you just keep entering until you win and then you can't enter it anymore? Yeah, because that, that requires some kind of almost like a, a cooperation or a partnership amongst these separate competitions to say like that we're going to enforce this or we're going to reference each other's, you know, for that calendar year or whatever, the last 12 months from when ours takes place and blah, 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 blah. And I, I, I think that's just too, probably too much to expect. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I don't think it's I've, done very often. <laughs> God damn internet. Uh, I think, uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it's too difficult. Cause I think most modern competitions have pictures of who placed online. And so like what you could say is if we discover that your miniature placed in another competition, not only are you disqualified from this, but also future competitions for this thing. So it's like, okay, there's a big threat there. And, you know, things like Nova Open, things like uh, ReaperCon, things like uh, um, maybe not Gen Con, but they all post the stuff that wins to the internet. So it's like, it's pretty easy to figure out if uh, a piece had what or not. Do you think that there's some kind of a downside to that in terms of diluting the quality of pieces at multiple competitions? So mm. what what I mean is... All right, if you can only bring your best stuff to one, then you're going to bring your stuff to the mo- your best stuff to the most prestigious one. And yeah. then um second most prestigious, third most prestigious, fourth, so on are going to be more diluted from high quality stuff. And then when will they ever build up their own steam and kind of rapport to have a really strong painting competition if not only are they going to have less quality, but they're going to probably have less quantity. If you're always worried about that. I guess that's true. The plus side to that is that it gives space to newer painters and lower competitive, uh, uh, like, uh, events to actually win something for once. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the plus side, but also a little bit of a reality check here. How many people are actually doing this? Yeah. Um, That that, that was where I was going to go next is if it was a, Abused, and I don't that's maybe not even the right word. If this was done on the regular, where people toured their competition pieces, even after winning, then yeah, I think this kind of partnership you're talking about or cooperative would be very valuable. Mm-hmm. But, and I think even just having it in your rules and maybe not even like hardcore enforcing it, I mean, people would know. Um, it's not, there's not so many painting competitions out there. Mm-hmm. that you know it would no it would fly under the radar but i don't think it's done very often i think where you see it more often is where people have a really nice piece that they painted a lot uh for, for a lot of hours <laughs> and it didn't win in there it in the thing that they really wanted to win at and i'm gonna give you an example because i think you know what this is yeah i know what's gonna happen is it have wings it's got it's got wings with eyeballs yeah so Richard Gray, la- the last year of Adepticon's Crystal Brush, so I've been 2019, brought his Mortarian. And you probably, most of you, know the Mortarian we're talking about. And if you don't, mm-hmm. we'll put a link down in there. This, The pictures of his Mortarian wings were the most liked 
most like responses on Instagram and Facebook to any painted mini I have ever seen ever yeah by a yeah. lot those wings and he took it to crystal brush and it didn't even place yeah it was in the monster category right yeah yeah and and so then he I, took it to golden Demon. i can't even imagine what he was feeling like <laughs> when that happened dude like how many hours did he spend on the just the wings yeah and then for it not to place dude i would i'd be devastated yeah so where'd he go after that uh he took it to i and i don't know if he took it to other places but i know he took it to golden demon at it was a games day or whatever one is warhammer fest warhammer fest yes yeah he took it to that and he placed there okay so which was a few just a few months later i think yeah. last year um, the most egregious <laughs> offense or abuse, if you want to call it that, of touring a miniature that I'm aware of is in the 2016 Crystal Brush. The best in show winner was painted by a Greek painter who's uh, Kyrikos, Kyrikos Simos. Um, it was a, there's a, the base is a giant book and there's a knight and a female and it's a super interesting composition. It was sculpted by um, a well-known uh, Greek sculptor as well. I uh, can't remember his name right now, but the logo is a skull. Help me out here. Michael Contreras. Yep. Contreras sculpted it. Uh, Kyriakos painted it. Uh, he won Best in Show. He won Athens Model Show. He won Montes Han Savino Best in Show. And it was like, boom, boom, boom. They're all like right in a row. Um, you know, and at that point, that's when this, I really started thinking about this. I was like, is this okay? Is this, is this fine? Do people mind this? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it would frustrate me a little bit, uh, especially if I was not as good a painter as some of these guys that are just slamming it all the time. Maybe that's more a reflection of how painting competitions are judged and less so about, um, like touring your, your miniature. I'm not sure, but Hmm. that's, that's what I'm, that's what I remember when I think of this topic. Sometimes I think those outliers need to happen in order for us to be aware of the potential negative impact of them. Yeah. So him sweeping probably the three biggest competitions in the world, I, you could probably call those th- the big three. I mean, there's probably some debate there. But I certainly think of Crystal Brush and Monte Sansovino as one and two, whatever, yeah. whatever you put them in. And then, yeah, you got Salute, you got Scale Model Challenge, Athens Model Show, you have Hussar, you got, uh, there's one that I can't remember. World Model Expo is coming out, but that's only every other, every other year, I think, every two years. Um, and then Warhammer Fest and with uh, Golden Demon. Um, there's probably a few other ones that ReaperCon, KublaCon, Nova mm-hmm. Open. All right, I'm done. That's all I can think of. <laughs> Great. Congratulations, Scott. <laughs> I know things. Yeah. Um, so I think sometimes some of those those things need to happen for changes to be made. Surprising mm. that there wasn't a change made after that, like an official kind of change. But also, if you if your piece is so good that it can just run the table, I say fucking go for it, man. Try to run the table. Yeah. You know, because here's the other thing is that if you're doing that, you're taking it all over the world. You're taking the piece, you're physically going, you're, you know, you're spending money. You know, mm-hmm. Like this isn't just like, Oh, I'm doing this and I'm making a quarter million dollars with every win. You know, yeah. no, you're not, you're not making money in any of the European ones. Yeah. You're ma- you made some money in crystal brush, but quite frankly, it's not life changing money in the slightest. Um, right. So I don't, I don't see it as a, I was just checking and making sure my camera is still recording. I was freaking out for a moment. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't see it as a, a major thing. I think if you take, cause those are kind of all big hitter shows, but let's say you, you win, mm, you win the Slayer sword at Adepticon 2021. And then you go to Gen Con and then you go to Nova and then you go to Reaper and then you go to Drake, whatever. Let's just say all the, all the painting competitions in North America after the first place you took it, you took it 
to the golden demons and you took the slayer sword that kind of feels like going to the middle school in your neighborhood and like you know trying to fight middle schoolers as a grown man it's just like (laughs) dude what are you doing you won the biggest thing like you you're 40 years old bruh (laughs) <laughs> why are you trying to pick a fight with a 12 year old yeah pick on someone your own size kind of thing yeah okay so you're saying okay i think i interpret that in a reverse order it was like you go to a smaller competition and then you just keep elevating it until you get to the hard one that felt a little bit better but yeah if you started and you want a slayer sword then you brought it to your local games workshops painting competition <laughs> and you're like Bye! bitch and it's just like guy get out of here like no one likes you you're not cool um give me that gift card i need that five dollar gift card (laughs) yes not even to games workshop it's to the starbucks next door (laughs) yeah i think overall this is just one of those like dramatic things that really is inconsequential i don't think it's anything we should probably lose sleep over get super hyped about but in certain circles where competition painting is is very important and you spend a ton of hours, people are very, you know, aggressive, I would call it, competition painters. This is one of those niche things that some people can get really upset about. Yeah. Um, okay. So last question. You were showing a competition. Would you allow a previous winner that you were aware of to compete and place in your competition? Yeah or a nine? Like if the same, like they brought the piece from last year? No, like a different competition. They won somewhere else. Oh, I'm starting. You were aware of it. Starting my own. Yep. If you were running your own painting competition, would you allow it or not? Well, from a marketing standpoint, I would allow it because mm. I want to increase the amount of entrance, the amount of pieces, the amount of um, pictures being shared for my event. Because I'm starting a new event, right, Scott? So it's a new event and I need my new event to be publicized. And I think Mm -hmm. doing that, you know, if I restricted it, it it couldn't help me. Um, Unless, here's the caveat to that, unless I restricted it and the big ass prize pool. Yeah. If you got the money, if you build it, they'll come. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So you could be the one if you have a valuable prize pool, then your competition could be the one that starts the cycle essentially and right. has all the cool stuff. Right. Um, so yeah, um, I feel like I wouldn't allow it. Um, but I don't know. Now that you mentioned that thing about having cool photos, having the coolest miniatures at your competition and, and, and you know, having all the cool top dogs, maybe I wouldn't, I don't know. I mean, if you had the money, and the way we're planning this, we got the money. <laughs> and we have a system, right? We have a system to how we're going to get this money. Oh, yeah. We got yeah. the money. It involves digging tunnels <laughs> underneath. And, and illicit activities. <laughs> right. Yes. And so if we had the money and we were the only place not allowing it, you're, you're exactly right. They would bring the best pieces to us and then take them on tour afterwards. So mm-hmm. we're the place where it's seen first. So it's like, yes. you know, seen live for the first time in the world at TendyCon is. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's what we're calling it. That's it. Mark it down. Ten, put your calendar. Put it on your calendars. You know, it's- everyone gets a four piece of cane chicken tendies <laughs> with their admission. <laughs> It's just like the, the whole like food area is just different tendies. Just yeah. Oh, over there's the buffalo tendies. There's the bone in tendies. Bone in tendies. Yeah, that's right. We got bone in tendies at TendyCon. <laughs> Doesn't even make sense. No. Like artificial bones. Like they're <laughs> added after the fact. <laughs> the, the meat's removed from the bones and then it's fucking re-added back in. I mean, it's oh, not man. real bones. It's just like they, they we like shove a Twizzler up there, and so it's like it's, it's not a real bone. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, you know, come to TendyCon, come for the tendies, stay for the painting competition. That's our logo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I didn't, that, that's the selling point right there of the con. I didn't have one before, but now I do. Yeah. Okay. That was a good conversation about that. I honestly went longer than I thought I was going to. We yeah. Have a talent on uh, really uh, stretching out uh, things longer <laughs> than maybe they need to be. <laughs> um, next question comes from Colton Letty. Court and, and Larry. 
Colton Liddy. And specifically, he asks, are GW painting tutorials helpful or harmful in the long run? Heavy metal style with no realism. I want to expand this question to give it more meat. Not just heavy metal style, but also the kinds of stuff that Duncan did on their channel. And also, what's that guy's name? Peachy? Peachy? Yeah, Peachy, Peachy and Cream. I always think that Duncan's name should have been Cream. So then it's Peachy and Cream. <laughs> anyway. Because he's so, Wait, the, he's so a white. new guy. I thought his name was Cream, actually. <laughs> All right, that's it. We're starting it today, folks. Whatever that dude's name is that's there with Peachy, his new name is Cream. This Dude, the deadpan delivery of that name, I was like, oh, shit, that's his real name? Okay, I'm going with it. Yeah. That's I thought it. you were being real. It's but no, that's the question. Both Evie Metal and the YouTube channel's tutorials, are they harmful in the long run? This is going to be kind of a hot take. I can feel it right now. <sighs> the heat is arising. Um, just an, an opening thought for me about this. I feel like any tutorial about something subjective, as long as it's framed in the right way, couldn't possibly be harmful. And the way you could incorrectly frame something subjective is by making a claim that it isn't subjective, that it is objective. So an example would be someone saying, every metal paint scheme is the only way to paint. Every other way is inferior. That, mm. is, a fa that is false, right? That, that would be harmful. But I don't think anyone's doing that. No, uh, I don't think yeah. so. I don't think that's the claim that they're making. No. And, and to be fair, we're not, we're not talking about their painting videos in terms of this is how you paint like the box art. Because, mm -hmm. in fact, the way that they teach you in the Warhammer community videos is not the way that they paint the box art. Correct. It's, it's phrased, and I don't think they're, I mean, mm, yeah, I'll say it. They, they are trying to get you to believe that the way they paint in those videos will get you to be able to paint like the box art. And that's the, te the techniques that they're teaching you. Uh, I don't say it are helpful in that regard they don't hurt you um here's how i think they're helpful it is a if it is the way for you to take the leap or to paint more or to not feel so overwhelmed they, they're very easy to kind of digest right it, it's very step by step and no single step is overwhelming even like i remember a, a duncan video where he painted the trans uh, nagash's cloak he painted the transition between the back dark purple cloak and the ghosts themselves, a bright, bright green. And how he painted that transition was like he made zigzags of the colors. And then he just like zigged down with purple and then zagged up with green and then zigged <laughs> down with purple and then zagged up with green. So then if you crossed your eyes and you stood 20 foot back, it looked like it was, <laughs> it was blended. Yeah. Um, that that that's an example of something that's horseshit. Like that technique's garbage, and you you'd be much better off trying to actually learn a a much more effective technique that's not any more difficult, like wet blending or feathering, um, that you're actually going to use more often, make you a better painter. You know what's strange? I haven't watched many videos by Duncan. I've watched maybe ten in my life, from start to end. And one of those 10 is that Nagash one. And I remember specifically the part you're talking about, but I happen to remember, I thought it was glazing. I thought he was glazing the purple into the green or something close to glazing to get that transition. Uh, I remember, I mean, it's probably been two years since I watched it, but I remember some, a, something, a technique I had never seen anywhere else is where he makes like these zigzags where the colors kind of connect like a, um, like a zipper. Hmm. And he may eventually do some kind of glazing after that, but it's like he doesn't let the colors really work. To, I don't know. And so that's kind of weird. Yeah. So, okay. There are some instances where the GW approach to painting, the base coat wash, jam pack all my highlights into the edge of the miniature. Um, that approach has been frustrating for me from someone who gives feedback a lot. Uh, I definitely run into it where several of my viewers 
come into my Discord or, or ask for feedback, and they're painting in that style, the GW style, if you want to call it that. And it's very difficult for them to break out of this 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 style of thinking and, and to paint maybe more zenithly um, or to paint in, in a different style or to think of uh, a miniature in a different way. And it becomes very prohibitive uh, for their painting because they just can't imagine a world in which you wouldn't wash something for sh for shading. Mm -hmm. That anything beyond that is very very confusing. Um, you know, I feel like learning any specific one person's style would then make it very difficult to be receptive of another person's style. So it's like anything you learn in the beginning might be harmful to you and to your learning in the long run because of that. Um, maybe there's something to be said about what you learn in the beginning. Uh, how that could be helpful to learn additional things and, and get more information and grow. So maybe the argument I'm making right now is that the GW style of painting doesn't allow for expansion of your knowledge and growth of your knowledge. Maybe it's not very easy to expand on that. I don't mm -hmm. know. I just talked a lot. What do you think? I th here's, here's the danger of it, the way I see it. Um, the danger is that we as humans... Um, Whoa, deep. <laughs> as a we as society, <laughs> <laughs> um, we as uh, we as a race or a species that has evolved over hundreds of thousands of years have certain things that have sticked with us in who we are. One of those things is survival instincts and how this manifests itself how we'd see this today is there's many ways but one one of those ways is um kind of a, a pack mentality in that if you are part of a group if you associate with others then you have a group that will protect you and you will have numbers and then the other small caveman tribe won't be able to come in and murder you all in your sleep and take your cave. Okay. This is real. Okay. So, yeah. It's, so we feel good. We get good kind of um, chem brain chemical reaction to being part of a group. And because of that, we also have a xenophobia. So I'm associated with this group and folks that aren't in this group are put a potential threat. And so whenever I'm out on the, on the plains stalking saber two tigers with my rock, if I see somebody else and they're not from my group and they're a, another human, they're, they're a potential threat. And so do I kill him? Do I hide in the, hide in the bushes so he doesn't know where I live so they can go back and find where our cave is. And so they can murder all of us. So eh, whenever you meet somebody new, it's a, it's a threat on your whole livelihood. So that's with us too. I mean, that's the reason for racism. That's the, there's, it's, there's so many other things why that, that affects us. But mm -hmm. here's how it affects things like Games Workshop. Folks associate themselves with the models, with the painting style, with the paint range, with the products, as that is part of their tribe. Yep. And then if you are trying something else that isn't the heavy metal style, that isn't edge highlighting, you know, until your brain starts to ooze out your ears, then it's wrong <laughs> because it's different. Yeah. And it's not like what we do, you know, what we do, you know, in, for our group is better. And we're a bigger group. We're the biggest group. They are the biggest group. The games workshop in the hobby area in the, the miniatures community, they are the biggest group. So they can just bring their tribe right on through to your neck of the woods and kill you all because they're bigger. <laughs> And so I'm not saying anybody actually consciously goes through this in their, in their head, but this is what right. happens. And so I, I, I question um, anyone that, that associates who they are as a painter strictly with one other group or one other painter or one other style. Mm -hmm. the, the painters that are going to go beyond that are those that, that keep everything at arm's reach, appreciate it, respect it, learn from it but aren't afraid to try other things as well. Right. Yeah. And that goes for everything. Sure. GW people who purchase GW products and steep themselves in it 
might have an air of superiority toward other paint ranges and paint styles and products, but there are figure painters uh, who's, who paint exclusively display models who definitely, you know, turn their nose up to, to people who paint armies in a speed painting way. Mm-hmm. And like John is saying, everyone has something to offer to the to your your pool of knowledge, and learning from everyone is is the is the best way to go. So the original question: Are the tutorials helpful or harmful in the long run? I would say if they're getting you to paint your miniatures, they're always helpful. Yep. Um, maybe they'll make it a little bit difficult to learn something in the in the future, or for you to be receptive of new things in the future. Um, but they exist. They make you paint more. They're good. End of story. All right. If you watch them and you use the GW palette paper, they're fucking harmful. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to Christ. Uh, what kind of archaic world are we living in where you just got a piece of cardboard stock paper, <laughs> you put your paint on there, and then they expect you to pay like whatever $12 it is for a, you know, a booklet of that stuff. Oh my gosh. 10,000 markup. <laughs> yeah, that that is that is harmful. But if it if it gives you the confidence and comfortability to start painting, absolutely. It's harmful. Yeah. It's harmful if you think that is the right way and that is the only way. And it's har- how it can be slightly harmful is teaching you things that get so ingrained in your painting process that make learning other things more complex or more effective painting techniques that makes it more difficult for you to want to learn or try something new. That's, that's the biggest thing. And that's what we just talked about. Don't get so embed with embedded in bed with it in bed Ooh. with it. Ooh, la la. Yeah, there's some peachy and cream right there. <laughs> oh, um, I think we could probably make this question more specific again, because like if you're the kind of person who's not painting for the sake of painting, in your painting as a means to an end. Um, the tutorials, the YouTube ones specifically are designed for people like that who are just trying to paint stuff and get it, get it over with. Um, uh, so maybe this question is more for the person who is looking to paint and improve over time. Are they a good spot to start or not? Um, but I just wanted to bring that up just in case someone in the comment section said, hey, but what about me? This is how I paint. Um, didn't forget about you, buddy. Didn't forget. And you can take that as a starting point and go deeper into the heavy metal style or or become more efficient in terms of speed to paint out your armies faster. Mm-hmm. Um, and that involves learning and growing. And in both of those examples that are still very much on the, you know, the Hot Wheels track of the GW painting style, both of those involve learning and getting away from those videos to some degree. So... We should probably mention, I forgot about this, and I haven't done a lot of watching of these lately, but now the Warhammer community has broken up their their painting videos into three different three different styles. Oh, really? Yeah, one is the contrast style. So <laughs> the, the minis are just painted with, with uh, contrast paints. Obvious. Okay. <laughs> Come on, GW. <laughs> How is this? Di- it's the same thing every single time. <laughs> oh, at that point, it's the, oh, oh my God. Oh my God. I'm so mad right now. <laughs> Why do you even need videos about that? All you need is a, is a single picture. This is the color I use here. <laughs> yes. And then, and then you point to a video showing them how to use contrast paints. It's the same thing for every single fucking color. Is it not? Maybe, maybe I'm being naive. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Okay. Anyways, that, that 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 tilted me a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, we should do a. Re- that's what we should do. We should start a new video series where it's just us just doing reactions, like uh, like what's those dudes that we watch? Cody Co. Cody Co. Yeah, we do we do Cody Co. videos of us watching Warhammer videos, and we we just like, pause it and be like, hold up, hold up, hold up, bro. What's he doing here? Oh, skeleton horde. <laughs> <laughs> didn't see that the problem with doing a video like that is that you just seem like an asshole yes and so like they're so big that it, they can almost do it and get away with it maybe it's the way you say it the miniature <laughs> painting community is small and it's just it's just scary to try to punk on people uh when you're not that big um it's all about punching up not punching down you gotta make fun of bill gates and apple but they don't paint many so i mean yeah i suppose we could punch I mean, up. We could punch. Bill Gates did paint minis, and we shit on him. 
that'd probably be the end of our careers right there. Right. Like what you do in the drones, what you do in Bill Gates, you like get in clean water for most of Africa. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) What you done with your life. Okay. Anyways, I, I derailed you. I'm sorry. They have three styles of tutorials. One is the contrast style. Yeah. A very developed and hard one. Number, number two. And I can't remember exactly what it's called. I think it's called like traditional or, Okay. standard or something like that and it is all the old basic videos yeah and then number three i think is called advanced Ooh. and i've watched advanced and it's the same as standard but but i think they like do a couple extra washes or something <laughs> like it's not that advanced yeah they're not wet blending as far as i remember i mean i've not seen them all obviously they're not wet blending you know they're not Using a bunch, I think they use more like they do some glazing and some kind of color transitions there. But who does the videos? Uh, I don't know. I think there's that uh, peachy and then peachy and cream. Okay, cream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, cream. Um. So yeah. So maybe I mean it's been a while, so I'm not gonna completely shit on them. Now if they have three uh, three options, it's like a Neapolitan ice cream, right? You get to pick your flavor. All right, so that okay. was uh, Happy Family number two, which we will call the uh, you know the coconut shrimp. That was uh, mm. coconut shrimp by Colton Laddie. <laughs> and now our third and final topic discussion in this smorgasbord edition of Trapped Under Plastic would be regarding three D printing. Three mm-hmm. D printing. How does three D imprinting three D imprinting ooh three D printing impact the miniature space yes and this one might this one could possibly be its own episode by itself but i think we should be able to hit the high points um and i think why it's not well you 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 kind of threw these across the bow and i got to shoot some cannonballs at them was that (laughs) um this isn't a 3d printing channel or podcast and we can talk yeah. about it in some regards but it's not our forte yeah it's um, adjacent it is it is very adjacent and it is its own hobby in its own right you know and it's mm. there's a whole lot of details of 3d printing i don't know but what we're going to discuss is specifically relating to our miniature painting hobby mm-hmm. so this person we, we have unknown on this so we don't know who submitted this but it was submitted by one of our patrons all mm-hmm. three of these questions were and so we kind of predict that we're going to put in the cart before the horse here, do this style every, maybe once, uh, every couple months or something. So we want to keep getting more of these, your ideas for questions for quick hitter topics could be long topics for a whole episode could be quick hitter topics for these. So mm-hmm. patron patrons keep, um, coming. Yes. Pump us up. <laughs> <laughs> 3d printing. All right. We're just going to go these one by one. So let's just start at the first one and bop, bop, bop down. You want to do that? Oh, yeah. Maybe we can have some high-level thoughts about how 3D printing. Or maybe not. We can go through this one by one. So the first bullet point we have here is there are printable Warhammer parts. So if you wanted to print helmets for your Space Marine dudes, you could. Um, because there are people that design them and put them on Thingiverse for you to 3D print. Um do we want to say specific things about each of these bullet points? Yeah, I think let's talk about each one, how it, whether we like it, whether we dislike it, whether how, how much impact we maybe feel it has. Okay. Um, I really like this. I, I like I do too. a lot. Why? Why do you like it? I love that to, when I think of 3D printing and the way that I want to use 3D printing, it's to customize stuff whether that's bases or miniatures. Like if I want to, if I want my dude to have a, uh, maybe like something on his waistband, like an additional weapon or like a a little, uh, walkie talkie or whatever it is, I can create it and then attach it to my miniature. So I love this idea that you can convert and expand the existing range with stuff that you can print off. Um, is it affecting, the miniature community in a positive or negative way? I don't think it is at all. I think it's, it's adjacent. It, no one cares about it. It's not losing GW any sales. Um, is it, is it not losing them sales? 
for uh, printing specific warmer bits for your miniatures? Yeah. No, not this specific topic. I don't think so. Uh, I, I would, I could could see the other side of that. Okay. Okay. So if I need, it. all right, let's let's give this example, Scotty boy. You are converting your sweet ass blood knight on steed right and mm-hmm. there's these perfect perfect heads for them let's say you decided that these some sweet space wolves because they've got fangs look like vampires you decide i'm going to use the space wolf heads as my heads for my blood knights mm-hmm. so i got a couple options here first thing i do is i check if anyone has spare heads in my either local community or then i check facebook groups maybe then i check ebay okay and in there, I'm not necessarily costing GW more money, um, but I might be affecting the resale dollar amount of kits. Because one thing about Games Workshop minis is they hold their value better than a car. <laughs> hmm. Like you can resell your stuff, even painted like garbage and stuff for pretty decent percentage of what the box price is Mm -hmm. and so if me reselling or secondhand or bit sales like take this kit make a thing resell it and people that do that as a job of like breaking down kits and selling them out in parts if people can just print out or, or or buy someone else's printed out cheap cheap little plasma rifles and helmets and vampire heads i mean it's it's it has an impact is it i mean right now if i'm still fair and this is kind of my feeling through this whole thing or all of this is technology isn't there yet it's not there yet at the price point that we as consumers are able to to afford and create the quality that looks like an actual gw helmet now you could okay. sure three pre, 3d print their helmets and they look like little fucking marshmallows compared to the real gw sculpts <laughs> um, I don't know about marshmallows. Some resin 3D printers can get really great fidelity. Um, are they consumer ones? I don't know. Are they fine tuned? Probably. Um, but to talk about what you're talking about, so it's going to affect the aftermarket bits resellers, mm-hmm. which would then in turn affect GW because those people would then buy kits less and Mm -hmm. part them out less to sell because it's affecting their sales, their bottom line. Um, That's a possibility. It, it, it dries, it dries up the secondary market as well. Yep. You're not going out to just buy somebody's old group of, um, you know, space wolves on the, you know, on the moderately cheap from someone in the secondhand market on eBay um, either. So you're cutting out that. Which does okay. affect this does affect it as well them as well. I think in theory that's that makes sense. Uh, pract- practically, it's hard to know for sure. Um, if you are a viewer and you're listening to this right now, you should go to the YouTube video or if you're already watching the video, comment down in the description if having a 3D printer, if you own one, has saved you money in the regard of not needing to go and find bits from someone locally or buying a whole new kit for that bit. Um, let us know that's a thing that's happening. Um, yeah, I'm not talking about. If, I'm not talking around basing. I'm not talking about terrain. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is some great use for. It. I'm talking about your actual on the table models, Games Workshop mm-hmm. models, or yeah, you know, or P3 or Steamforge or whatever game you play, mm-hmm. Star Wars, whatever. Do you actually does that? Have you made that switch in some regard? And yeah. Does it, does, and does it look like they're holding a little squishy Tootsie Roll instead of a plasma gun? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Just spat all over your keyboard right there, bud. Yeah, there, bud. On my monitor, too. <laughs> um, there is one person in my Discord I know who does use 3D printed... Actually, two who use 3D printed parts on their Space Marines, specifically. And as far as I can tell, they look okay once primed. Um, but... Yeah, I don't know. When I was making my my Blood Knights, I did look on Thingiverse and in various places for uh, parts, and I ended up just buying them all, whether it was just due to laziness or because I couldn't find what I wanted for free or or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, 
it's a good bullet point printable mm-hmm. warmer parts mm. next one next one totally custom minis like from hero forge or artisan's guilds or titan forge or cast and play or any number of patreons uh that's give you stls to download and then print uh for you to print at home first thing i think of when i see all of these kickstarters and there's a lot of them now of stl files Mm -hmm. so i always wish they had an option for me to buy the freaking models that they print for me on their five thousand or fifteen thousand or thirty five thousand dollar resin printer. <laughs> That's what I want. I want the shit. I don't want to. I I got a lot of friends with three D printers, and I know that they are a hot mess to deal with. <laughs> they are a fucking disaster, a garbage fire. You know how often your regular two D printer breaks. What's the lifespan of a standard <laughs> 2D printer? It's like oh, I don't know if that's fair. It's like it's like a month after the warranty wears out, and the thing breaks every time. Every printer, always. There's freaking people that are still printer repairmen. That's a real job. That's a real yeah. job. You know yeah. what? Okay, you know what we're doing. We're gonna add another D. You know what that means? It's another time for it to get destroyed. 3D printing. <laughs> these things just they have so many tiny calibrated parts that just bust all the time you know what i want i want to buy your sweet ass sculpts hero forge and artisan guild from your awesome ass 3d printer that you got calibrated because you know what the fuck you're doing and i will spend more money and i want those minis that's what i want hold on hold on did you just come up with the d standing for destroyed and adding an additional d is an opportunity for it to be destroyed even even more did you just make that up right now yeah that's some quality comedy right there buddy (laughs) anyways uh you bring up some good points um yeah it's not it's uh, 3d printing isn't plug and play it's It's not oh here's the sd file even if it's already supported it's like it's not just put it on the print bed and hit go there's there's more 3d printing leveling the print bed what kind of resin you're using how long should you expose each layer what's your layer height there's a lot of questions um what environment are you printing in um so yeah, the problem with what John wants to happen, uh, having these companies print their own stuff, is they're not set up for production and they wouldn't be able to meet the demand, I don't think, uh, unless they were set up in a specific way. Um, it's like, oh, you don't, don't want think- money? You don't want money? You just want... I mean, it, it's a it's a sweet-ass business model because it's a ki- they can do a Kickstarter and they can it can be all in the hands of their customers like the day that the Kickstarter is finalized and the payment's done because they're not shipping anything. They're not making anything. They already made the files and they're just sending you a file. Think of the overhead that is completely, yeah. it, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's just the dudes that design these models. Yeah. And it's a, it's a killer business model for sure. Um, there, man, there was that one company we talked to at Adepticon that I was considering using for producing the duchess and they custom made 3d printers and they don't use resin printing or sorry resin casting at all they would just uh print everything that she would need and so that's an example of a company that would be capable of doing that um but for everyone else like okay so like uh you mentioned the price of 3d printers the really nice ones that make really nice details that can get into the the 30,000s, 40,000s. When I was talking to Pete from Creature Caster, he was like, oh, I just got a new 3D printer. And I, I mentioned a price, and he was like, add on a couple more zeros, bud. And I was like, oh, fuck. Like, these, these cost a lot of money. And so it's not a volume issue. It's not like, okay, Creature Caster could just buy five of those, mm-hmm. and then they could resin print everything they're going to sell. That's just not feasible fiscally. Um, so it just makes more sense to print a master and then cast it a billion times. Um, yep. Yeah, and so that's probably some of just my frustration with this is that um, there's a lot of folks that are are looking at, like, from a business perspective, entering the hobby, and this is the hot, easy money, right? Mm-hmm. And when I say easy money, I mean, if you've got someone that can, has the the expertise, the education, the experience, and the, the aesthetic to create these 3D sculpts, that's really all you need to do this. And so the overhead is so, so low to create something. The problem is, is that 
it's it's not so easily accessible to a quality standard that we'd want it to be to use it. And so I feel like there's other areas of the hobby that are suffering because so much attention is being pushed this way. Oh, interesting. Like what? Like coming up with your own miniature line, like coming up with your designs for um, other bases or coming up with just making uh, designing a small line that people can actually buy from you. Um, it's, it's all pushed this way. And, and I don't have anything particular. I mean, maybe it sounds like I have a lot against 3D printing. I don't. I don't. I just recognize it as a completely separate hobby that requires a lot of focus, uh, research, time, and troubleshooting. And so for most of us, we have a finite amount of hours in a day. We want to paint every day. Granted, you can get your 3D printer running and then it just goes for so many hours and you can paint. Well, yeah, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the hours that it, it takes to invest in that. And so I, th I think that 3D printing is impacting our hobby in positive ways. I think the technology still needs to get there. Heck, we I know at work, and I want to see if I can figure out how I can get in on, on these because I know a couple of the guys that run them. We've got three three machines that are three quarters of a million dollars each 3d printers and they they print things for the uh for surgery that go inside of people <laughs> so it's kind of important but their yeah. their resin bed is like the size of your bathtub <laughs> um and so i really want to like get one of these um i really wanted to to get one of the uh artisan killed things and just like send it all to the dude and be like hey dude can you print all this stuff on the weekend for me and it would look like quality of games workshop but i would get fired so i'm not gonna do you that. would get fired for that yeah i mean <laughs> yeah i'm pretty sure dang like 75 cool percent sure. though yeah i mean i could probably i mean they wouldn't have any problem with if i printed like one or two or whatever but like if i'm like <laughs> i'm like hey john why uh, why is there eight thousand dollars worth of resin gone because it's not just yeah. like standard resin that they use too. It has to be able to go inside the human body. And they have stuff that is, isn't like that. So anyway, I'm just frustrated. It's like, I want all these sweet minis and sweet sculpts. And you can't get them. You know, I can't get them. I'm trying to think of the solution to this. It's like, could every town have a super nice printer and you would just send it to that super nice printer and then they'd print it out and then they would mail it to you. This is like a government funded project where every single township gets a sick ass resin 3d printer and then you buy the files and send it to the master 3d printer and he prints them all out for you and then ships them to you and it's done. And it's like a service you pay for every single time. I don't know. You know, that's probably a business model that already exists. In, in it is for sure. Like I, that, I'm just, I'm just thinking. Like, why haven't I thought of this? I need to find these people. Okay, where's the dudes that have the expensive ass mop printers? They subscribe to all these fucking kickstarters. They have all the files, right? And all you do yeah. is, is you go to them and you be like, which ones you want? Here's the cost to print each one. They're the middleman that has the technology, the equipment, and the understanding of how to use it. So those, fr those freaking supports, freaking supports, <laughs> dude. Just, have you ever supported a model like in in Chi Two Box? Have you gone through that process? I've I've walked through it two times with my buddy in creating stuff for our D and D middles minis, and I just want to strangle myself with a, my sucks. belt. I hate it. it. Sucks. It's so dumb. The, uh, you do get faster at it, but holy cow! That first time I did it, oh my gosh, I took forever to manually support a model. Um, but yeah. Uh, okay. Next thing possible future for it in the hobby and are you going to get one well i already have one <laughs> so yes but i was given it for free uh so would i have got one no uh i'm a lazy person the only time i get out the 3d printer i did it one time for a video for a conversion for the novelty of using it because i thought i was going to make the video better uh every other time i've been paid to take it out um, I am so freaking lazy that I wouldn't have bought one for myself. Um, and even now I don't use it partially because I don't have a good space for it. 
I have animals that are in my workspace all the time and I don't want them to be licking the floor where I spilled a little bit of resin and then die or some shit like that. Um, there's just, there's health risks. There's, I'm apathetic and a piece of garbage. Uh, and so no, I wouldn't use one if I, I wouldn't buy one if I didn't have one now. Um, how about you? Are you going to buy one? No. <laughs> okay. No, I'm going to, I'm going to Google search on that dude that has the business model that I just thought of right now. I'm going to find Look up maker spaces. I'm going to find up, I'm find him. I have a buddy that has, in addition to you having one, but that doesn't really help me because you don't want to deal with it either. But I have a buddy that <laughs> actually enjoys like messing with his and paint and print stuff. So like if I'll buy files and have him print them or whatever, and he, he's pretty interested in it. Um, I'm going to do that. I'd much rather do that. Now, the, yeah. the day may come where I change my mind and that might le- lead into the possible future for it in the hobby. If there gets to a point where like, it's almost a requirement for some gaming, you know, and there's these amazing board games or RPGs or miniatures games that have no physical line and just have STL files and the games are amazing and everyone's playing them and everything. Well, probably then if that we get to that point, then this business idea where people will print them and you can just buy them on eBay or whatever will exist. And I still won't buy one. So there, final answer, <laughs> final answer, not buying one. <laughs> I, final answer, not buying one. It's not going to impact the future. GG. Yeah. Like if I won the lottery, okay. And I'm not working a day in my life from now until eternity. And I have a cleaning lady that cleans my house and I, and I have a <laughs> chef that cooks my dinners and you know i have a personal trainer and i have all these things and i live in a big mansion i will buy one <laughs> and then i will and then i will hire a dude to be the master of the 3d printer because i'm still not fucking with it <laughs> i think the 3d printing is super helpful for base building yeah i don't think it i think there is some difficulty to it but i kind of figured out most of it in like three or four sessions Mm. and now at this point i can print little sci-fi boxes or tubes or whatever the heck i want and i could make these things from scratch if i wanted to um but i can also i also know how to print them and get that crap rolling and save time but yeah there is a lot of learning that you have to do in the beginning whether that's having print failures and need to clean out your print vat every single time you print something or using the right or wrong resin or whatever they may be. Um, it's hard to know if it's, if that, if it was worth the time, the time, the time investment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but for base building, I'm still very much so interested in using and abusing 3d printing. Mm. I'm, I'm with you there. I'm with you there. All right. Well, we cracked through that happy pla- happy family, happy family platter. No leftovers. The all gone. The only thing that's left now is the fortune cookies, my friend. Mm, the news. <laughs> the <laughs> fortune cookies. Dude, how sweet would it have been if we would have been like thinking ahead about this episode and we had this happy family analogy running through the whole thing and then we each actually like had a fortune cookie and at this portion of the episode we crack open the fortune cookie from remote locations. It was just like we were just really professional. Oh, 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 and, and uh, the paper inside the cookie is a news item. Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> God. Uh, I th- I think people would hate that because eating those things they're so loud and <laughs> crunchy and loud. <laughs> I don't think anyone would have enjoyed that other than us. Check this out. Look, we're, we're cool. Uh, but yeah, out of the news. Uh, scale seventy five coming out with a instant paint. What's it called? It's I think it's called instant. Let me just look it up here. It's it's. It's for those of you who haven't heard this, seen this, it's on Kickstarter now. It is their new contrast paint like uh competition. So it's yes. like they're they're coming for contrast paint with their own thing. And yes. so this just uh you know, from the day that we're recording this, this just just launched recently. And so I haven't looked into it yet. There's I'm scared to do it because I'm scared that I'll I'll find some reason to back it. Um <laughs> But there, it's that's just it. It's fancy. It's kind of pretty. It's kind of something new and shiny. How is how is it different? I would like to learn more about how they explain that it's going to be different than uh, 
Games Workshop contrast paint? I think part of the reason why contrast paint tilts me so much is not because like, oh, it's uh, I'm a I'm a display model painter and this is not good paint. It's it's nothing to do with that. It, it's th- the reason why it upsets me so much is that it's a clever rebranding of something that already exists. And it's like revolutionary. And it's like, dude, this stuff has existed under our nose forever. And it's like, I just wish I thought of it or something like that. It's just a heavily pigmented wash. That's literally all it is. It's it's nothing special. And so now other people are jumping on this train of one coat wonders. And it's just like, come on, guys. Come on, bros. Oh man, it looks like they already have 1,100 backers and 200 grand in their pockets. Link, link this to me. <laughs> I can't find it. It's because you don't know how to work the matrix like I do. Yeah, no, you are you are Neo. Uh, I am both the most anti Neo. I'm trying to find the fucking Facebook tab for like and <laughs> get to my <laughs> get you a message. You're an old man. I don't understand technology. <laughs> instant colors yeah um i don't know anyone let it let's let us oh know. god hundred and ninety five thousand dollars ninety nine hundred and ninety seven it's going up like mad uh so it, if you guys are backing this post in the comments if you're backing it and why like what about it and i'm not gonna i mean hey I'll, like i said i'm perfectly honest here there is about at this point probably a 40 percent chance i back this I haven't even looked at it yet. 40%? Yeah, dude, because I am bored and want to buy shit. Um, <laughs> but if it comes true that I read the whole thing and it gets me, that number's going to go up. So I am not judging. Why, like, what What about it caught your attention if, if you d- decide to back it? Or if you, like, looked at it and thought about it and decided not to back it? Let me know that, too. I'm curious why. why what's the deal? All right. That's all we got to say. We share that. Um, we got two things in the news about Games Workshop. Um, the first l- least exciting one, but it's st- I think probably more important one when it comes to our society as a whole, is that Games Workshop has announced that they are reopening their physical stores um, in locations uh, that allow it. So if mm-hmm. um, your location, wherever it is in the world, is allowing for some non-essential stores to be reopened, they are going to do that. Um, they said stock will be limited, at least at the beginning, which means basically it's like what they have is what they have. There's mm-hmm. going to be restrictions in place, no actual gaming in the stores, which makes sense, respectable. Yeah. Um, right, right. I think that was the big thing. Oh, no, no painting demos. Okay, I was going to ask, can you paint in the store? But yeah, that, no. that makes sense that you can. But other than that, it looks like it's pretty much like everything else, which is fine. You know, I think okay. that's great. And so they're, they're pushing there. That, ex- that excites me because it feels, I don't, it's not a one-to-one correlation of them starting up the factories again, but I feel like it is. I feel like we're that much closer to starting up the Games Workshop factories again, which is a big deal. It's a big deal because if they start them, if the longer the time goes by with them not starting it, there's like this backlog of everything gets pushed out. Because let's say the day they start the factories running again, they're not just going to like bam, 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 release all the things <laughs> that they've been teasing for the last month and a half. They're still going to put them on a, like a stretched out the fucking schedule and now everything will be pushed back even further. So no, your swamp elves that are bound to hit us <laughs> are now going to hit us in like 2032. So now you're screwed. Swelves. Swelves. <laughs> um. Yeah, I just had this vision in my head of like smokestacks, like the smoke comes out again and like giant gears start turning <laughs> and the monolith that is GW starts pumping out my <laughs> minis. You can't see humans. It's just smoke and then out the door comes nicely plastic wrapped boxes <laughs> of miniatures. It's just like Willy Wonka's factory, but nerdier. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They got Oompa Loompas in there. It's, it's, it's tiny minis making tiny minis. That's what it is. <laughs> what do you get when you gobble down paint? <laughs> I ain't following that up. Okay. <laughs> you can go down that trail by yourself. Um, yeah, that's probably exciting for a lot of people. Just so that I'm sure there are people out there that haven't been able to buy stuff and are done painting things. I know in my hobby group, uh, not my hobby group, my, like uh, the Facebook group that I'm a part of, the Frozen North. 
Um, Denort. There are people that are like, hey, I finished my stuff. Where can I buy things? And they're like, oh, you can't from GW. So there are people out there that are like, I want to paint things and I can't. So I'm sure people like that are excited to hear that this uh, is impending. Dude, I think when they announce that they're going to reopen the one in Minnesota, we should go and we should uh, tailgate. We sit in the parking lot and we just drink beers outside the games workshop and we cheer Dude. we cheer at everyone that walks in. That would be so <laughs> uneventful. <laughs> it would we could make if we spent like 6 hours we could probably make a kick ass 6 minute video. <laughs> <laughs> Just shake oh, just confused people as they walk out. Like, uh, what is going on? Why yeah. are you cheering me? Yeah, it's just like Stone Cold Steve Austin shake up the beers and crush them and drink them as they walk out of the store. Like, <laughs> you did it! You did it! You bought some goblins! Whoa! <laughs> this is a great. This is All a right. great video idea. Why are you? All right, you, you can make the drinks? video. I'll tag along. How about that? All right, okay, you can do that. Um, the more important GW news. Yeah. Is, well, to you are these big giants. They are called the Sons of Behemoth. Yes. And they That's what I remember. are massive. Um, they, they recently showed at a Games Workshop's latest Saturday morning cartoon version of a, of a, <laughs> <laughs> of a release stream, which I... I mean, I'm glad that they're doing it. It's something because like it's something, some little bit of excitement in our weeks or months or whatever to kind of watch what's happening and new models yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, but th- oh. those, those giant, giant, um, giants are big <laughs> models. So they recently showed a, a kind of side by side of a bunch of different models and they mm-hmm. are, um, as big or slightly bigger than oh. knights, knights from 40 K. I'm looking at this right now. I'm looking at it compared to the old giant. Holy butt cheeks. The yeah. one with the executioner hood, that one's sick. Yeah. Um, there's, that one's pretty awesome. That's The thing is, that's one kit. One kit has all the different things to make all yeah. these different dudes. Yeah, yeah, and it, and High value. And it sounds like there, it sounds like there's going to be more heads than those three. Because like the, oh. like the Gargant heads from the regular one had like six heads or something or four heads or something in the box. So I'm guessing there's going to be a bunch of different heads. And this is probably going to be 140 bucks for this kit. Stands, oh, wow. Stands, Where do you get in that value? The same price as the Knights from 40K. Okay. And I saw a meme of someone had a start collecting box. It was the start collecting box, Sons of Behemoth, and it's one model. <laughs> 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 oh, that shit's funny. I don't care yeah, who you are. Funny. Um, Man, yeah. So this is the, this is the third out of four announcements that gw is making it's the last one in april so i think we're gonna it's the last so it's the four out of four no it's not four out of four it's still only three but they said it's the last one in april so i'm guessing the first week in may they're probably gonna have another one and here's the other thing too they announced that earlier on that this was all the all these four were going to be from adepticon going back into my discussion about the factory shutdown i think they are pushing back the announcements because they can't they're not going to have product out to go on the same schedule as the announcements and release schedules. Okay. Get what I'm saying? That's yeah. my theory. There may not be any truth behind it, but I think it's pretty, <laughs> pretty legit. Um, I'm looking at some of these other releases. I'm not a big fan of, uh, big monsters. Um, so I, I am never going to buy this stuff. Um, but there's like these Canaanite shadow stalkers make me very happy they're uh, so cool they're so cool but the, the thing that's cool is that this is a canaanite air quotes branded model while also uh not being specifically like a one of the witchy half naked i'm gonna slaughter you thing so what it makes me think is that canaanite is just the new word for dark elf mm. i thought that canaanite was just um just the Canaanite portion of the previous Dark Elf range, which is which was the sisters, uh, the half naked chicks. But now this makes me feel like they're going to expand it to include other things. Like these guys look Dark Elfy in new ways. I'm very excited about this. Yeah, they remind me even the way they painted them. If you remember that uh, old, like I think it's like Dark Elf Assassin or something, where he's jumping off of a rock and he's got a dagger in his hand. And he's kind of 
jumping and he's he's got that yep. purple cloak just like these guys reminds yep. me a lot of him yeah which is a good thing because that's a cool model that's a sick model yeah very dynamic yep. Yep. all right that's freaking cool so that's our newsy news newsy news done Woo! all right welcome to the end of the podcast thank you for hanging out with us and going through this asian family style meal mm -hmm. uh, motley crew of topics we appreciate that let us know what you thought of the combination of topics into one super topic Ooh. Uh, if you liked it or you hated it or if you want to hear more of those smaller conversations that we might be able to have john how can the people support our humble podcast or not so humble <laughs> <laughs> ego filled podcast um there are a number of ways first um giving us a rating on apple Podcasts helps more people find us um mm -hmm. liking subscribing sharing the video on youtube brings more nerds into our sprued and spruette community and the more we can get our greasy tendrils into everyone's orifices the better <laughs> in the long run um so those are some free ways you can support us by buying some merchy merch, such as the shirt mm -hmm. that I am wearing today, Trapped Under Plastic, and soon to be some new merch, hopefully in the, the uh, foreseeable future. Um, mm -hmm. if you can also support us by becoming a patron. This would go a long, long ways for us to continue to buy Dr. Pepper and Diet Mountain Dew, um, <laughs> even in the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> um, and, and in reality we we spend that money to improve the the podcast in every way we can so obviously we're two remote dudes now and so um we're spending money so we can do this we could luckily we our our microphones um that we invested in work well for this as well mm -hmm. um what did i forget did i forget any other great ways oh what other mm -hmm. things you get for being a patron right Oh sure. Oh yeah, sure. About that. So you get direct access to us. You can you can chat with us there right on that page um, through the Patreon. Uh, you get access to the after party, which is an extended version of the podcast. We do another 20, 30, 40 minutes with some cool things there. You can uh, share what topics you want us to, to have for the podcast, and we will pick from those. You can submit pictures of your minis that you painted, and we can critique them in the after mm -hmm. party. And you can do nothing else. That is all you're allowed to do ever, 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 ever. Oh, and you can join our Facebook group. That's not associated with the Patreon. Everybody, Patreon, everybody can. Everybody can come on in. Everybody. Yeah, it's open to the public. Last thing that happens in the after party is we talk about something new we did. Oh, yeah, something new we tried in our miniature painting journey, which sometimes they're pretty sweet things. And other times... Uh, Scott just figures out how to paint dots. So <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound a lot less clear than it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'll see you in a Monday after the next Monday. So that would be two Mondays from the Monday that this was, was released. So we're going to get better at this. Yeah. I feel way. like we, it's going to get better. If we just keep saying the same stupid shit over and over again, sometimes <laughs> it will get better. <laughs> so until then we will catch you on the flippity flop.